Hi, my name is Don Riley. I'm with uh, Fire Department in Virginia. I recently attended a CBRNE class, which is Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear, and Explosive class, during which they teach you the medics how to uh, treat patients that may have Ebola, uh, major diseases that come in from other countries. During that lecture, one of our instructors brought up Dr. Tent's name and stated that the American public, our immune systems have gone to shit because of our diet and the pills we take and the sodas that we're fed and everything that we eat that is bad in the American public. So hearing his name, they put up his video and we watched the, the one about the vaccinations and how our children could be sub -sub susceptible to um, all these things that foreigners are bringing into the country. The people that would attend the CBRN class would be um, any type of first responders, which would include the U.S. Coast Guard was there. We had the United States Navy there. We had U.S. Army was there for uh, the chemical biological. She was attached to that unit. We had FEMA team members. We had all our local fire department members. We're on a medical strike team, so they sent us there. It's just first responders in general take this class, and it's taught throughout the nation. And actually, I believe they teach it in other countries now. Um, and it's a chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive class. So I hope you guys watch this, and I hope that it helps you. How's everybody's summer going so far? <laughs> well, this has been quite an adventurous time for me since my last lecture, and maybe I'll be able to cover a little bit of that at the end if I can, if time permits. How many people are here for the first time? Raise your hands. This lecture isn't really for the rookies. <laughs> <laughs> so. This is definitely a lecture more for the veterans than the rookies. <clears throat> so I'm going to apologize to the rookies before I start. And you'll understand that as <clears throat> things unfold here. It's frustrating going through life watching people buried in a belief system that has no basis in fact, and it's basically propaganda. And if you hear things enough times, you start to believe them. So at my age, I'm 54, my cup has been pretty full with all the things that they, you know, public school taught me and the things the doctors taught me. I grew up in Livonia. This is, you know, a hometown area for me. And either A, you play the game like everybody else, or you try to make a difference because I find it amazing going through this 31 year career how many health professionals will do things to you that they don't do to their children. How many things that they'll do to you, they asked the, a lot of cancer doctors, would you take the treatment that you do? A secret survey. The majority said no. They asked the cardiologists, do you take vitamin E? Most of them said yes. Would you recommend it for your patients? They said no. <clears throat> I find this interesting. <clears throat> you ask the doctors, do you get all these shots that you're supposed to get? No. <clears throat> now, to, you know, if you want to be a gangster, you know, Wall Street has openings. <laughs> the Democrats and the Republicans are loaded with gangsters. <clears throat> the country's been taken over by gangsters. <clears throat> so today, I'm going to seriously challenge your belief system. <clears throat> Much farther than you probably thought I was going to challenge your belief system. 
So for the rookies, <laughs> just hopefully you've done your protein shake and <laughs> I don't think this lecture's ever really been done before. I've been putting some things together for years, and finally, with the help of a lot of health professionals, and I know a doctor's seminar that I was at a week ago, he had to tell this entire crowd of doctors, I was there for continuing education, I gotta say hi to Dr. Stuart White, because he said, I want all you doctors to go to Dr. Tent's autoimmune lecture. And I was slinking down in the back in my usual position. <laughs> he said, he did not tell me to say this. So I know there's a lot of health professionals out there, and I hope that you're gonna get some insight so you can go back to work tomorrow and start saying some different things, and I think you're gonna learn something today. So Stuart White, I don't know whether to be happy that you said that to that entire crowd or not, but we'll see how this goes. Now, since the last time I was up here, <clears throat> I cannot believe how many stomach problems. Now, before I start, I don't want to pigeonhole myself with this type of a disease process. <clears throat> you know, my, I have a pretty standard practice. I have lots of skeletal issues, back and neck things. I have a ton of stomach problems. I have a ton of autoimmune problems. I have kids. I have old people. I have an entirely, you know, widespread practice. It's not just about this topic, but this topic I wanted to cover once. And this is gonna be a, an interesting topic for you. Now, I have so many stomach problems that come into my office, I cannot believe how many people have stomach problems. How many people out of this crowd, whether you're a patient or not, have suffered significant stomach problems? Raise your hand. <clears throat> okay, good. Dr. Jeff is gonna do a lecture on pediatrics 101 to protect your children, part one. <clears throat> He's been doing some great lectures. And how many people have gone to Dr. Jeff's lectures? Raise your hand. Good, he's helping you navigate this health world that has seemed to have been derailed. I just am counting down the days till the government takes over my health care. I'm just, you know, Michelle Bachman said something that represented me and I'm not necessarily endorsing her. She said, a lot of people don't have insurance because they don't want to have insurance. I've raised my family without health insurance because I've kind of separated myself from that system. I cut that system loose when I was 13. That was it for me. My kids are 20 and 22. They've never been to a pediatrician. They don't even know what they do. And I've chosen to raise my kids differently. I don't need the government telling me how to raise my children because I don't think they can actually run the government. <laughs> so if you, if you get a handle on the government, you can come and take a shot at me, but until then, just work on what you're doing now. That's right, I got the clicker. All right, here we go. They finally trusted me with the clicker after all these years. <laughs> it's like, I've grown up. Maybe not, they might take it away before this thing's over. <clears throat> I was really excited that the AMA site, Virtual Mentor, has suggested that they pass a federal law so I have to take part in vaccine trials. How many people would like to take part in vaccine trials? Raise your hand. How many people would like to be experimented on? I, I don't even know how to answer this. I don't even know what to say. So they want to pass a law, so you and I have to. They're tired of getting like the homeless and the unemployed people. They want to really get into mainstream America. Now, as we start, cancer and autoimmune diseases are linked. This lecture is gonna be broken into four parts. We're gonna start with a history lesson that most of you have never heard before. <clears throat> there's a history lesson, there's a good side, there's a dark side, there's my autoimmune stuff, and then I'll, there's all the patients. So you have to sit through this beginning history lesson. 
before we move on to the autoimmune stuff. Viruses have been suspicious in the start of cancer, and this is a short review of the literature. 1901, 1911, 1930, tumors, breast cancer in mice. They studied chicken tumor cells. They started to find microscopic findings in 48. They found virus-like bodies in human breast cancer in 49. They were able to give mice cancer in 49. They started to think in the 50s that virus is a huge cause of human and animal malignancies. Oops. In 51, viruses they thought were the cause of cancer. 53, they questioned whether leukemia was caused by a, a transmissible virus. In 55 is where things started to get interesting. In 1999 to 2001, the story that you're going to hear was investigated by 60 Minutes. And they put more time and money into this story than any single story they had ever done in history. More money and time than anything. And by the time they got done, they said, there's no, there's no way we can talk about this topic. Dan Rather killed it. I'm trying to get this back. Is this, if I get this back, can you see better? I don't want you to sit where you can't see. I'm always in the back row, so I understand that. <clears throat> I was hiding at Dr. White's lecture, and he had to say that in front of everybody. <laughs> my, my own business in the back, where I do my best work. And I was working on this lecture actually in the back. No, I was listening to Dr. White. He said, you got to send me a copy of this DVD. He's a great practitioner from Houston, Texas. So this never aired. This was absolutely shelved. 1942, antibiotics were released. 1943 was the onset of the polio epidemic. There was a panic about polio. Just people can still have held on to that panic. 999 out of a thousand people that had polio thought they had the flu. It looked like the flu. There was a very tiny percentage of patients that actually developed paralytic polio. The amount of people that had polio at its epidemic was two weeks of patients that have died from cancer. So things started to get strange when they started to use antibiotics on viruses and they knew they had to make a choice, restrict the antibiotics or develop a vaccine. Polio was going up, started the trend down. If you look at history, diseases have been cyclic throughout history. What actually stopped most of the diseases, which the doctors like to take credit for, was sanitation, sewage control, refrigeration, central heat. When you watch gun smoke days and you look at the nice little town, they had open sewers in that town. This was absolutely a disgusting place to live. It didn't look like it lived there. Central heat, they say, stopped whooping cough. So despite the irritating patients that are the engineers, you've actually had a huge part in stopping disease. And those involved with the vaccine, Dr. Salk, Bernice Eddy, Sarah Stewart, these were brilliant women whose, whose place in history has been absolutely neglected. They were absolutely brilliant women and Dr. Sabin. Salk polio vaccine was rushed into production. We had a president that had polio. The public was being, you know, it's like terrorism, it's like drugs, it's like the swine flu. We've all seen these panics before and we're kind of getting tired of the panics. <clears throat> but Dr. Salk had strains these polio strains that would be inactivated with formaldehyde and injected in the children. <clears throat> just at the, at the absolute, just before they did release this, Bernice Eddy was a brilliant bacteriologist at the National Institutes of Health. She was told, you better safety test this new salt vaccine. She discovered faulty batches of the vaccine 
What she found was that the virus wasn't dead, but still alive and able to breed. When she tried it on her monkeys, they were paralyzed in the cages. She tried to delay the release of the vaccine. A handful of prominent doctors stepped in to throw their weight on the reputations on the side of the vaccine. Dr. Alton Oshner was a major stockholder and the past president of the American Cancer Society. He was so convinced of the vaccine that he pulled the entire medical staff together at Tulane University. He vaccinated his grandchildren. He killed his grandson in 48 hours and his daughter got polio and was paralyzed. 48 hours. By the way, they eventually, the kid went on to sue Cutter Labs where it was made and that was thrown out. Despite that, the mass inoculation proceeded on schedule and within days, children fell sick from the polio. Some crippled and some died. It was the biggest fiasco in medical history. There was lawsuits everywhere. The director of the NIH resigned. The secretary of health, education and welfare stepped down. Old Tricky Dick, Richard Nixon, was given the job of restoring the reputation of the National Institute of Health and back in 1955. This is a timeline we're going to go through and we're going to finish up the current time. Bernice Eddy was taken off polio research and transferred to the influenza department where she meets Sarah Stewart. These become lunch partners. Stewart proved that some cancers were caused by viruses as well as discovery of DNA recombination, which is still used today. In 1957, they named it polyoma. A virus causing cancer was called polyoma. <coughs> Sarah Stewart and Bernie Setti discovered this virus which caused multiple cancer tumors in a variety of small mammals. It was the first time one virus caused cancer in several different species. She then took suspensions of the material from these kidney cell cultures, injected them into hamsters, and the cancers grew in the hamsters. Now the problem was the vaccine manufacturers had grown their polio viruses on the kidneys of monkeys. And when they removed the polio virus, an unknown number of other monkey viruses came with it. The more they looked, the more they found. Medical science knew little about the behavior of these monkey viruses. This was a watershed event in cancer research in 1959. Now to this day, when you go into the doctor and ask, how did I get this cancer? Viruses have been a major player and they can't talk about it because of something that happened to you. In 1959, Bernice Eddy, confronted with overwhelming evidence, came to the conclusion they had just inoculated an entire generation with cancer-causing monkey viruses. She was the first one to predict an epidemic of cancer in the future. 1959, that was the year that it became classified. Done. That everything stopped when it came to public information. Soon, the research identified an Asian monkey as the natural host of the cancer causing, at the time, they called it the polyoma virus, and gave the virus a less hysterical name, SV40. You know why they called it SV40? Because they found 39 viruses before this one. In 1960, the, quote, the clip that you saw was by Maurice Hilleman, the head of Merck's vaccine research department. They also found the simian virus on renal monkey cell cultures, and they found even Sabin's oral vaccine was completely contaminated, and that was fed to millions of people. Now, this affects me. My father had polio, so I grew up with a father that I've, I've told my father in the past, I'm grateful that you had polio because I never felt that my kids should have the shot. I'd never felt like, it never entered my mind. Because I don't think that, I think my father was sick and broke down and picked up a virus that everybody else seemed to fight off well. 
SV40 is so widespread right now, it certainly, we could take blood samples on most of you, and most of you, this is rolling around inside of you, including me, you're going to see that in a minute. <clears throat> the front page of the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, 97, this was the cover. SV40 was one of several dozen viruses that contaminated the original Salk and Sabin polio vaccines administered to children. This is going to tie into the autoimmune lecture. SV40 is repeatedly extracted in bone, brain, and lung tumors today. I have had six of my friends die from brain tumors. In the last 10 days, I have had at least seven or eight patients that are nurturing a 48 to 58 year old right now with brain cancer. My hockey buddy that I'm gonna play hockey with tonight just went to say goodbye to his sister, she's 50. They gave her a, a, a cancer drug so that you can only do one time in your life and it fried her brain and the cancer came back anyway. A guy was in Monday, said I'm all broke down because I'm trying to nurture my sister and take care of her kid. She's 53, she's had three brain surgeries and the cancer keeps coming back. How many of you older people remember hearing your entire generation littered with brain cancer? Are you tired of hearing about brain cancer? It's everywhere. And it's on people my age. I've been the fun, I lost one of them, one of my hockey buddies. And his, and his, his uh, sister-in-law was in today and this kid and the brother that I still play hockey with could not even come to this lecture because he said he won't be able to take it. I remember the fundraiser for his brother. The USA Today had a big article that I used, it's on the wall in the office. They're finding this monkey virus in 43% of tumors with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Two of my friends in chiropractic school had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Two of the kids that I grew up with. The research was done, etc. October 1960. Bernice Eddy gave a talk to the New York Cancer Society, and without warning, the NA, NA, National Institutes of Health and Advanced announced she'd examined the monkey kidney cells in which the virus was grown and found that they were infected with cancer-causing viruses. <clears throat> this went over like a brick. This was tantamount to forecasting an epidemic of cancer in America. No suggestion of cancer-causing monkey viruses was welcomed at the National Institutes of Health. When the cussing stopped, they crushed Bernice professionally, took away her lab, destroyed her animals, put her under a gag order, and delayed publication of her scientific papers. <clears throat> 1961, federal regulations went into effect in the US that required that one virus which was the worst one, to be removed from the polio vaccines. But the law said you don't have to destroy the seed lots and you don't have to recall the contaminated vaccines. They continued on schedule just like they had. The contaminated vaccines were administered to children and adults until they were used up sometime in 63. In 1962, Sabin, introduced his oral polio vaccine. What was the problem with Sabin and Salk? They used the same culture medium, which was what? Monkey kidneys. So he decided to use a live weakened polio virus. Here's my records, which I found two, about three weeks ago today. Three weeks. I never, I remember standing in line at Taft School in Livonia for this little sugar cube in a little dish. I remember standing in line because some of my friends got in line a second time. Because there's, I think they've been heavily fluoridated friends, but I don't know. I'm like, I don't think you should, I remember, I don't think you should go in this line a second time. <laughs> There's my records. I found out three weeks ago, now watch, one, two, three, four, five. I got five of those injectable vaccines. I only remember the sugar cube. I remember 64 and 64, oral and oral. I've had seven of these. I've talked frequently at these lectures 
if I ever went down with the brain tumor, lung cancer, or one of these other cancers, there's nothing you're gonna do about this. And I'm gonna show you how to activate this and inactivate this. So you look at my cancer lecture that I did, why I hit my immune system so hard, this is what's rolling around inside of me. That's just the polio. This doesn't count all these other things. Animals are littered with viruses. I did not know this till three weeks ago. From 55 to 63, almost every dose of polio vaccine produced in the world, 200 million Americans got it. They estimate that out of us right now, one out of every 200 people are getting cancer from SV40. They figured they caused 15 cases of cancer for every case of polio. Sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They started to realize cancers were skyrocketing and it was the cancers they had no explanation for. Skin, lymphoma, prostate, breast, lung. I just saw the melanoma story again Monday night. They're trying to get us to buy the melanoma. For example, Superman's wife, what was her name again? No, not, not, <laughs> no, not Lois. That's TV. <laughs> huh? Dana, Dana Reeves. Yes, I always, I always liked Lois. They made such a good couple. Uh. <laughs> Oops got lung cancer and died, never smoked a cigarette in her life. So now you see why lung cancer is skyrocketing, because this caused it. As smoking's gone down, lung cancer has gone up. The 10-year-old girls that got the shot in 55 became an age in, at 40 in 1985. This is when things started to go crazy in the cancer industry. To quote the polio vaccine developer, I think to release certain information is not a public service. There's too much scaring the public unnecessarily. Oh, by the way, your children were injected with a cancer virus and all. That's not very good. <laughs> Americans are getting faster cancer faster than ever. And the USA Today and JAMA in 1994 tried to figure out why are baby boomers getting cancer so much faster than their parents at the same age. Men born between 48 and 57 has three times as much cancer as their parents and has nothing to do with smoking. They can't explain it. They know something else is going on here. And if you want to know really where, how far this thing can actually go, it's sexually transmitted also. <clears throat> they found it, oops, they found it in 45% of seminal fluid and 23% of blood samples. Go get a blood transfusion today. I'm gonna to cover blood transfusions when I talk about how your immune system <coughs> collapses. You can pick up a blood transfusion and you can get that SV40 virus and something you never even got the shot. You got the transfusion. That means that SV40 is found in children and grandchildren, people that have never had the shot. This was classified. This was a national security issue that's been blacked out through history. They didn't want this ever released until this little lady started talking in 1999. I'm gonna give you all the references. You're gonna be Googling this on the way home. You're gonna, I'm gonna open up a, a, a level of study that you're gonna find fascinating, and I haven't got to the bottom of it. It's a, it's, it's a wormhole within a rabbit hole, and it just keeps going. By the way, there was an SIV virus also in that <coughs> vaccine that acts just like AIDS. It's called simian immun. It's a much smaller virus, and it's much more difficult to kill. The smaller the virus, the harder it is to kill. <coughs> I have some clips, bonus clips at the end of this DVD that I'm not gonna have time for to play that are just fascinating. This is one I can. 
The many top dog researchers who is in Vancouver for the International Conference on AIDS. He is Harvard educated. He has a doctorate in dental medicine from Tufts University of Massachusetts. He's an international authority in public health education, and he's also a prolific author. When Dr. Horowitz first heard the theory that the AIDS virus and other killer germs were deliberately cultured as biological weapons and deliberately targeted at unsuspecting victims, he thought the mere idea mad some wild conspiracy perhaps or at least good grist for a sci-fi novel somewhere along the way he's changed his mind he's presenting his investigations at the AIDS conference in Vancouver on Wednesday and Dr. Horowitz joins us in our studio when did you go from thinking this was Stop. a mad idea to a possibility <clears throat> Robert Gallo group at the National Cancer Institute and Lytton Bionetics also experimented with monkey and human cancer viruses, and they developed mutants. These with viral nucleic acids, including those that caused AIDS, white blood cell dysfunction, leukemia, lymphomas, sarcomas. What is progressive wasting is that? Does that look like an AIDS patient? And death in cats, mice, chickens, and humans. This is what they were manufacturing. Next. It took me about eight months having a document sit on my desk, which was a 1970 appropriations request for $10 million mm -hmm. for the development of AIDS-like viruses. And it sat on my desk, and I realized I read it. It said the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council informed the Department of Defense that they could develop synthetic biological agents for germ warfare in 1970 over five years for the cost of $10 million. And that led me into investigate... That. Now this is, you know, people sign, we make copies of these DVDs and all the patients come in, they can get these, and you're gonna have to read a lot of these slides, because this one, he's, the, what, you, what you read is better than what he's saying. Finally, these and other National Cancer Institute investigators infected, in, injected such mutant viruses into human white blood cells and fetal tissue cultures to enable them to infect humans and even transmit the same disease. Go ahead, finish it. Whether that document was accurate, whether it was real, and then I began to investigate what happened to the money. And that's what ended up in me looking, finding the origin of AIDS in Ebola. What do you believe about the origin of AIDS? What I know and what I'm presenting on Wednesday is that it's a man-made virus. There's no question in my mind these viruses are man-made biological, um, weapons, if you will, or they were developed for cancer research models uh, by National Cancer Institute researchers, people under National Cancer Institute contract, who also were contractors for the Department of Defense. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Next slide. Kelly did a great job helping me put this. This lecture was far over my head. This was way too much to try to do, but this story just kept building and getting deeper. 1971. The first thing Nixon did when he became president was declare a war on cancer. In the first week, he did that because he inherited cancer. It was done in the previous administration. They knew what had just been done to the American people. And panic started. Panic at the highest levels. They knew they were in for an epidemic. Doesn't he look so presidential there? <laughs> Doesn't he? You, you'd trust him, wouldn't you? I don't trust any of them. In 1960, the team was established. Here's the past president of the American Cancer Society. Here's Sarah Stewart, one of the most brilliant researchers at the National Cancer Institute. And here's Mary Sherman. Mary Sherman was, an, was, a, was a brilliant orthopedic surgeon. She was a radiation specialist, and they put her in charge of the big lab. Just, you're gonna, this is all gonna fit just sitting. The big lab was ran by Dr. Mary Sherman. They needed a laboratory so they could start. They were trying to come up with a vaccine to stop the cancer epidemic. That's what was going on in Louisiana. This is gonna tie in, wait till you see what this, what this ties into. 
so they had to have a government hospital. They got the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital, which was operated by the U.S. military, owned by the federal government. It was a full-blown U.S. government laboratory financed with millions of dollars from the public treasury. Here, they put a 5 million volt linear particle accelerator. They had 159 covert research projects set up. Remember, this is the big lab. This is where they were trying to stop what just went in all the people. Next. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Dr. Alton Oshner, this is his little history. Head of surgery, Tulane Medical School. One of the first guys to say cigarette smoking caused lung cancer. Had the famous Oshner Clinic in New Orleans. In 49, became president of the American Cancer Society. He was a staunch anti-communist. In 1959, the FBI cleared him for a top secret position. Sarah Stewart was recruited in 1960. She left the National Institutes of Health and went to the US Public Health Service in New Orleans, believing an anti-cancer vaccine was possible. Dr. Mary Sherman was the director. She was an expert on radiation. If a vaccine were to be developed to prevent an epidemic of cancer in America, the research was going to have to be done quickly, quietly, and privately. It was done by competent professionals, someone with resources, and someone willing to take the risk. Perhaps a vaccine might arrive in time to prevent a horrible and unprecedented wave of cancer among the American people. If they succeeded, they'd be heroes praised by the press, welcomed by a grateful public, and rewarded financially and socially. If they didn't succeed, no one would know because nobody stuck their neck out. How do you develop a vaccine? You kill it or weaken it. <clears throat> the larger the virus, the easier it is to kill. The problem, viruses are tiny. Viruses, <clears throat> a virus would not be stopped by a condom. There's not one virus that's going to be caught. When they tell you this is going to stop a virus, it's not. Viruses are far too tiny. So the chicken virus, the poison eggs with formaldehyde, killing smaller viruses like SV40 is best done with radiation. They needed a linear particle accelerator. Nixon went to the CIA and told them, take some, you need to take some of the millions of dollars that you stole from everybody to pay for the linear particle accelerator. This is not a cheap device. The monkey viruses in 62 at the big lab were radiated by the linear particle accelerator. They wanted to try to alter the genetic code, hoping something would be better. It only got worse. Then they invented, they, then they, they'd radiate it, pull out the virus, put it in the mouse. They were growing tumors and mice bigger than the mice. <clears throat> then they'd take it out, put the tumor in a blender, grind it all up, send it back to the lab, radiate it again, stick that batch in mice. They were looking for a way to come up, but it only got worse and not better. Smallest viruses like HIV are so small, you, they're hard to kill with ionizing radiation. If you don't kill it, you mangle it, you scramble it, and you make it a mutant. Now you've changed the genetic code and you made something that history has never seen before. And the bottom line is it may be less or more virulent. 1959. Castro's revolution starts. New Orleans is dependent on Cuba and Latin America for their trade. This was very, very important to New Orleans. They needed this place to stay like it was. They didn't need a communist to take over Cuba. 